Okay, so I'm happy to introduce Glenn Moody. He's a journalist, uh, writes mostly for Tech Dirt, uh, based in the UK, and he'll be talking about ACTA. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially to see so many people from all around the world. Um, I'm going to be talking about a slightly more parochial issue, which is how ACTA was rejected in the European Parliament uh, early this year. Uh, when these slides come up. There it is again, yeah. Can we maximize it? Yeah, great, okay. Right, um, so um, January 2012, if you can cast your minds back to that, um, things weren't looking too good because in November 2010, ACTA had been finalized that far back. In April 2011, ACTA was published formally. We'd had leaks before. And then in October 2011, ACT was signed by all these nations, but not by all of them. There was the EU and Mexico that hadn't signed at that point. But if you cast your mind back, um, certainly I felt that there was nothing going to stop that happening. And there didn't seem to be any resistance whatsoever to EU signing and then ratifying. It seemed to be that ACT was doomed. But then we heard uh, earlier about SOPA uh, in the US. We had this net-based resistance. That was the very interesting thing about it. Um, they had internet blackout, and then all these sites, and eventually they were withdrawn. And this was an amazing event. I mean, it really was something quite surprising at the time. What was really interesting is that the following day, there was a meeting in Poland between uh, NGOs and activists with two Polish ministries. This was meant to be just a kind of routine meeting, but it turned into something rather dramatic, because the ministers announced that they were going to sign ACTA. And this went against a uh, kind of informal agreement that nothing would happen until the problems around ACTA had been resolved. So they really felt rather betrayed by that. And the interesting thing is, apart from the anger, there was a lot of action. Now, the person who's uh, chronicled this, uh, Michal Wozniak, at this address, if you're interested, uh, has some very interesting thoughts on why this happened. First of all, the Polish government went back on their word, and that always makes people angry. There was this deadline of one week. If you've got two or three months, you tend to waste a lot of it. So when there was just one week, people got active very quickly. Polish activists, like many of you here, have been following ACTA for a very long time. So they knew what the issues were. They, they didn't need to think about it. The sober victory the day before, he specifically mentions that that was a big factor in getting people fired up, which is very interesting for the knock-on effect. He also says that in Poland, people had a very clear memory, either directly or through their parents, of what the communist years were like, what censorship was like, and what loss of liberty was like. So this was something very real in Poland. It wasn't an abstraction. And this got people out onto the streets. Um, interestingly, um, Wozniak says that this was spontaneous grassroots stuff. This wasn't organized by the NGOs. They took on the role of coordinators, but they didn't make it happen. And I think this is really important. It was the people getting out there. One decision they did make, which I would emphasize, I think it was very wise, was a no logo rule. When people took part in these demonstrations, they didn't do it as a member of a party or a group. There were no logos. This was a single cross-party protest. So it was the people against ACTA. Um, so tens of thousands of people eventually took to the streets in minus 30 degrees centigrade. And I think that speaks volumes about the seriousness of the situation that people did this. A few other people joined in as well, which is slightly more problematic, because the political um, uh, reaction was that we wouldn't give in to blackmail. The Polish government said, you know, people on the streets, people taking down our websites, this is just sheer blackmail. And then on the 26th of January, they did indeed sign ACTA as they threatened. But things were happening. People were getting angry. 64% of the polls who were polled in this uh, particular uh, questionnaire said they were against ACTA. 1.8 million emails were sent. That's a huge number when you think of the size of Poland. And so the government started getting worried. It calls a dialogue, you know, this kind of key word for, hang on, let's cool things down a bit. But that didn't work. On the 3rd of February, just about 10 days after that first meeting, the Polish government suspended ratification. So in 10 days, we'd gone from the Polish government saying, tough, we're going to sign this, you know, get lost, to saying, hang on, we're going to stop a bit. But even that wasn't enough. On the 17th of February, the Polish government actually asked all the other EU governments and the European Parliament not to ratify. So in the space of less than two weeks, we'd gone from a situation of real hopelessness to one that was getting pretty interesting. Europe too, the rest of Europe was getting pretty busy. On the 25th of January, the um, member of the European Parliament, Marita Schaka, 
published a document on Reddit, and it's interesting she chose Reddit for this, saying she was worried about ACTA. On the 26th, uh, Kada Arif, who was the rapporteur, the kind of appointed expert for ACTA, resigned. Um, and he spoke of ACTA's masquerade. So people were already starting to back away from ACTA. Also dramatically, on the 31st of January, the Slovenian ambassador who had been in Tokyo, who had signed on behalf of Slovenia, issued a public apology saying that she hadn't thought about what she was doing and she wished to uh, apologize. And interestingly, it was people sending emails and using Facebook that partly made her think about this. So this is showing the impact of digital activism. Okay, so following in the footsteps of the uh, polls, uh, were European-wide protests. These um, <clears throat> were mainly organized by um, Netzpolitik uh, Org in Germany and La Cota du Net in France. And also, uh, I also mentioned the important uh, Twitter account, uh, Stop Actor, which acted a focus. And I think it's quite important that we had these focuses for people to go to to get information because they had to get things happening very quickly. And indeed, they did do that. We had some pretty massive numbers coming to the streets. These are approximate because it's very hard to tell how many did turn up. But certainly Germany uh, had a, an immense number across dozens of cities. Even smaller countries like Denmark uh, put 15,000 people on the streets. So this was a, a very rapid mobilization of people, largely through using the internet in various forms, blogs and Twitter, Facebook, to get people out there. So things started happening. Even before those um, protests, people backed away. These countries, four countries, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Latvia, and Germany, all suddenly halted ratification. After them, another three. What's really interesting, if you look at these, is they are all countries, like Poland, that knew the realities of totalitarianism. They knew what censorship meant. They knew what loss of liberty meant. So it's probably not so surprising that these countries were the ones that led the way. Okay, so obviously the European Parliament, uh, the European Commission, sorry, was getting worried at this point. So they kindly offered to refer the whole of ACTA to the European Court of Justice, to the Supreme Court of the European Union. And this was um, asking whether ACTA was incompatible with the fundamental freedoms of the European Union. But as they well knew, that was the wrong question. Nobody was really saying there were fundamental incompatibilities. It was about the details, it was about what it actually meant. <clears throat> they also knew that this would take two years, probably. So this was a, a clear attempt to actually dissipate people's anger. And I think credit should be given to uh, Jeremy Zimmermann for stating immediately that this was not acceptable, that we needed a vote in the European Parliament, because it was a clever tactic on the European Commission's part. They were trying to split the uh, movement against it. And uh, I think Jeremy rightly called out the fact that we, we needed to go to a vote. And so it was maintaining momentum. And that momentum did carry on because people were all the while contacting MEPs, sending millions of emails, and people again started backing away. The new rapporteur, David Martin, on the 2nd, uh, 12th April, came out with a recommendation to reject ACTA. Um, he actually said most of the things that people in this room have been saying, that it was a really bad idea, as did the socialists, as did the liberals and democrats, who all came out against it. And then... In the European Parliament, you have these dedicated committees who are the experts in particular areas. So we had industry, legal affairs, civil liberties, and everyone came out against ACTA, recommending to the European Parliament that they shouldn't vote in favor of it. I think one particular uh, committee in particular needs mentioning, which is the jury committee, because that was headed by, or still is headed by, Marielle Gallo, who is a French MEP appointed by, or effectively appointed by Nicolas Sarkozy and responsible for the Gallo report, which I'm sure lots of you know. She's a, a real copyright maximalist. And it was expected that she would at least get her committee to vote in favor of ACTA. And the fact that her committee also voted against ACTA, I think, shows the, the sheer strength of opinion that the public brought to bear on that. I think also credit needs to go to Amelia Andersdotter, the Swedish uh, MEP who was on that committee and obviously argued against ACTA very persuasively because she carried most of her colleagues. So we had the 4th of July, the plenary vote. Um, it was a stunning victory, 478 votes uh, against, only 39 in favor. 
Notice the 165 abstentions. These basically are the cowards in the, ME, in the European Parliament. These are the Conservatives and the other sort of centre-right who didn't have the guts to say I'm against ACTA because they knew that the people didn't want it. So instead they said, well, we're going to abstain. But I mean, these people were against it, but they were just being cowardly. It was an amazing majority. It was also historically very important. It was the first time an international treaty negotiated by the European Commission had been rejected by the European Parliament. Now, there's a very important reason why that was even possible, and that was because of the Lisbon Treaty, which had changed the relationship between the Parliament and the Commission. In the past, it was not possible for the Parliament to overrule the Commission. So this was the first time the Lisbon Treaty had been used to assert the independence of the European Parliament. I think one factor in favour of, of rejecting ACTA was that it was an opportunity for the Parliament to assert itself against the Commission. And so that was a very important issue. So, to conclude, let's just look at the, I think, key issues that uh, happened and the lessons to be learned here. One thing leads to another. If you uh, think of all the tiny little uh, events which in themselves weren't sort of critical but put together made things happen. So, this kind of cascade starting from SOPA and all the historical background, it's amazing how complicated the, the situation was. The small pieces Lucy Join really is you. I mean, it's all the different activists around the world who, by coordinating, by swapping information, by sharing information about what's going on, planning things, made things happen. Even though singly everyone is rather weak, collectively they're quite strong. We have the technology and we have the brains. We've been using technology and using blogs, using Twitter, using Facebook. And this is a huge advantage over the forces ranged against this because people in the uh, opposing camp, the copyright maximalists, the very traditional uh, MEPs, for example, they don't use technology. So this is a tremendous leverage that we have. And I think it's very important to keep that going, that we must always use all of the technology available to us. Um, because we have the brains to actually make the most of that. We have the ability to analyze things and to get the information out using these technological tools. And again, that's a tremendous advantage we have. You know, the fact that we've got the smartest people on the planet in this room and elsewhere is an unfair advantage, I think, because we're fighting against people who aren't necessarily quite so gifted. But we have to use that because there's rather few of us and rather a lot of them, they've got lots of money, so it's the only thing we've got, really. The joy of text. Uh, one of the key things about ACTA is that we had the official... Uh, text of the treaty. We had leaks beforehand, but when we had the official text, we could pull it to pieces, and we did. Once it was formalized, you can then point out why it's a bad idea. If you contrast that with TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, we're very hampered by the fact we don't have an official document, and therefore we're shadowboxing. We're fighting against an invisible opponent. So I think that emphasizes why we have to fight every time we can to get that text. Once we've got that text, we've got a very powerful weapon. Something else that's very important, um, it probably isn't so obvious to you, but as a journalist I was very struck by that amazing volume of materials that you produced. That every week, every day, there was something new about ACTA. And this weight of information, this weight of discourse was really important because it, it's something that MEPs, it's something that the mainstream media notice. So I would really urge you to keep writing, keep analysing, keep sharing this because it creates this kind of weight against these things. Sounds strange, keep politics out of it, but that, that was one of the key things I think that happened in Poland and indeed in the other demonstrations across Europe is that they weren't aligned with any political party. They were essentially the people coming together to protest against ACTA. I think that was a very powerful message for the politicians because they couldn't just dismiss it as the kind of usual troublemakers. United We Stand, I mentioned this before, but there's a very interesting anecdote I heard, which is that from someone inside the uh, European Parliament, normally when MEPs get all these emails and get all this trouble, they go down the corridor and they have a word with their mate and say, I've got this terrible problem, all these people keep sending me these emails, and the person down the corridor says, well, we don't have that, I wouldn't worry about it, it'll go away. But that didn't happen with ACTA. When they went down the corridor, their fellow MEPs said, yeah, we've got those too. It seems to be coming everywhere. And there's this sense of the whole world focusing on the issue against ACTA that made the MEPs take notice, at least one of the reasons why they took notice. So um, to conclude, uh, I think it's perhaps dangerous to see 
the victory over ACTA as a turning point. It's far too early to say yet. It is true, I think there has been some uh, knock-on uh, benefit. Uh, you probably know the European Commission has announced that it's going to be conducting uh, an inquiry into copyright, and the terms of that seem to be much uh, more friendly to reform than they would have been, I think, a year ago, so I think there's already some collateral benefit. But the main thing, really, I would emphasize is that this should act as an inspiration for us. It shows what can be done uh, in the future. And so on that note, and wishing you um, a successful conference that may also act as inspiration, I thank you.